everybody for coming. Uh, my name is Marcus Miller, as you, uh, most of you know. I'm the director here at the Gordon Snellgrove Gallery. Uh, I want to thank all our uh, Aboriginal and Métis brothers and sisters for sharing this land, Treaty 6 territory, with us. And I'm really happy to introduce uh, Ray Poisson here, who's going to give us some color on archival materials. Uh, I can just mention that uh, at this show, Douglas Bentham, is uh, having its closing reception tomorrow night from 7 till 10. And Douglas will be here, and he's going to do a kind of a walkabout to talk about his work as well. So uh, please come by if you're in the neighborhood and so exposed. So uh, Green is uh, currently working at the uh, Western Development Museum. And it's, can I call it an internship? Yeah, that's what it is. And I don't get paid for it. And you don't get paid for it. Okay, so <laughs> it's part of my schooling. Am I on? Hello? Yes, yes. I use the microphone. We're trying to get better sound on our recordings now. Um, so uh, uh, she's on this uh, internship at the Western Development Museum because she's part of a, uh, she's in a postgraduate uh, program in uh, cultural heritage, conservation, and management at Fleming College right now. Uh, so, uh, but Rain is really a graduate of this department and she graduated in 2014. Uh, with uh, her show is called Clouds and Shit. Um, uh, but I think you didn't actually put that on your announcement. You did? Yeah. Good. I'm, I'm of course happy I did. did okay, good. Good. And she's actually been, uh, she's, she's maintaining her practice, which is quite uh, uh, admirable, I think. And it's a tough thing to do once you get out of art school is how to pay rent and continue to make art. So she's, she's had a show uh, at Sky Up Gallery in 2015. And a significant uh, uh, project that you were involved with uh, was uh, the Child Taken project. With, uh, and it was Susan Schantz who got that together. And you were working with, I don't know how many people were in the class, like 10 or 15 people, or yeah. was it a smaller group than that? It was around that size. So uh, one of uh, Rain's works uh, now from that project, if I've got this right, is now in uh, the collection of the Saskatoon uh, Tribal Council, yes? Mm -hmm. So that, that's really great. Um, uh, she's also, she did a lot of volunteer work when she was here and uh, um, uh, uh, art camps. Uh, you were also very involved at the, uh, on the uh, student council, the VASU student council here, right? <laughs> and so that's a lot of work and, and, and encourage all students here uh, to uh, uh, get involved on that student council. It seems to be uh, in limbo this year and uh, we don't have students that are quite as enthusiastic as your group was. Rain, but uh, Rain has done lots and lots of volunteer work, and I'm very much looking forward to this this uh, talk on archival materials. So, Rain Poisson. Oh, well, thank you for the warm welcome, Marcus, and thank you all for coming as well. I'm really excited to do this talk because I'm interested in it because of my career path, but also because I'm I'm an artist first and foremost, and when, I wanted to do this talk because I started looking more at my own materials and what I've been using. And I haven't really thought about what I'm using currently and how it will be conserved for long term. And especially if I'm going to be a rich and famous artist someday, people are going to be paying big money for my stuff. But what if my stuff isn't made with the proper materials? So I started looking more into the components of them. Um, so I'll talk about artist materials and their archival stability. Uh, so what Marcus already pointed out, I graduated here first with the Bachelor of Fine Arts and Studio Art in 2014. My graduating show was Clouds and Shit, <laughs> very professional. Uh, and then in uh, 2016, I went to Fleming College for the Cultural Heritage Conservation and Management course to become a conservator. And so a conservator is somebody who's responsible for the repair, preservation of works of art, buildings, or other things of cultural and environmental interest. So basically, we fix all the old crap you see in museums and galleries. <laughs> and so as conservators, we look at the agents of deterioration, which are 10 primary threats to heritage objects, artwork, and we le learn how to detect, block, report, and treat damage they cause. And so I'll outline these agents so that when we start talking about things in artwork, these are the things we're looking at as conservators. So fire 
um, is a main one. It can cause smoke damage or complete and total loss to an artwork, just um, And it can be in sources of art, especially in contemporary art or digital art, with uh, wires, combustible materials, or open flames. Pests are living organisms that uh, disfigure and damage artworks and cultural materials. These can include bats, rats, uh, bugs like carpet beetles and clothes moss, and it also includes microorganisms like mold. And all those material or all those pests are attracted to materials made out of uh, plant or animal fiber. Uh, thieves and vandals are people who do willful damage that is premeditated or crimes of opportunity. Uh, premeditated can be somebody comes into the gallery with a knife to slash up an artwork for political reasons, or um, in the moment, if somebody sees a big sculptural piece with bits to it, they might just grab a piece and pick it up and take it home with them. Uh, light UV and infrared, this d damage is caused by overexposure to natural light or artificial light. It can cause fading, bleaching, cracking. And light is a big one, especially for artwork, because you want your work to look as good as possible, which is a natural light. But the problem with that is light causes irreparable damage. So once something is faded or deteriorated, there is nothing you can do about it. Uh, incorrect relative humidity. And so RH is the amount of water vapor present in air. So when it's really humid, you can feel it. It feels like you're swimming through jello. And incorrect RH, um, when something is above an RH of 60 to 65%, that's when mold growth starts to happen on pieces. And fluctuating RH is really bad. It just causes a lot of stresses on your piece. Uh, water can be from natural occurrences, technological hazards, things like that. It can cause delamination in paintings. It can cause water-soluble glazes and materials, like watercolors, to disintegrate. And like metal sculptures can start to rust from it. Physical force is anything that uh, damages objects from rotation, deformation, stress, pressure. So you bump into it, you knock it down, or in shipping it can hit other things. Pollutants are natural or man-made gases, aerosols, and liquids, dust, or dirt that are known to accelerate decay of artifacts. And this is just stuff in the air as well. Even carbon and sulfur from vehicles, it's always in the air, so it's always a problem. But uh, aerosols and liquids that are commonly seen around artworks are household cleaners, bug sprays, and detergents. Disassociation is when you lose stuff. <laughs> that is an agent of deterioration. So that's when the, there's a loss in objects, object-related data, or the ability to retrieve that data. Especially with digital art, your hard drive may crash with all of your information on it. That's dissociation. And the last one is incorrect temperature. So temperature is too low or too high or fluctuating are all problems for artwork. Uh, usually temperature is, a lower one is better for uh, artifacts, but with paintings, especially like acrylics or oils, it can cause the paints to become brittle and fragile. So that was a quick summary of the agents, but it's important to know what these are because they can affect the long-term conservation and preservation of your works. And you need to recognize that uh, these will help you protect your work as well. And so in terms of traditional art materials, it's good to start looking at what your things are made out of because everything is made out of different components. It has uh, different degrees of quality as well. But what, what makes different degrees of quality? Well, I'll get into that. Uh, and so pigments um, are one of the main factors of your material. It's the colorant used. The binder is any material or substance that holds the material together. Solvents, um, they modify the properties of the film. You'll usually see them in oil paints, like turpentine. And then filler alters the properties of the material, such as giving it faster drawing time, better opacity. And different ratios and combinations of these components create different art materials. So. Not everything has the same binder. The binder for watercolor is different than the binder for acrylic paint. The filler for pastel is going to be different than the filler for gouache. And pigments are important to recognize because they're the most expensive part of your material and they can have varying degrees of toxicity, particle sizes, and qualities 
that make them suitable for some mediums, but not for all. You might see some colors being used in acrylic that can't be used in watercolor. And they're organized into two different types. So there's inorganic pigments, and these are from compounds that were never a part of a living substance. So that includes earth deposits like yellow ochre, mineral like cinnabar, lead white, which is a treated metallic compound, and fused metallic compounds, which includes uh, cobalts. Uh, inorganic pigments are always irregular in terms of particle size, and they can alter in shade from batch to batch due to impurities uh, when they're being excavated. The next one is organic pigments, and these are, these are derived from living substances or ones that were once a part of living things. So animal, then that includes bone black. Then there's plant, such as matter red, or it includes materials such as synthetic organic. It's important to know where your pigments come from because they will react differently. As said before, like inorganic pigments have bigger particle sizes, and the combination of an <clears throat> inorganic pigment with an organic one uh, can lead to the colors losing their brilliance because of the different particle size and it won't spread as nicely. So in terms of pigments, they should be fast to light, meaning they don't lose their brilliance when exposed to sunlight. They should be resilient to atmospheric conditions. Although some lead-based pigments are known to darken when exposed to sulfurous compounds in the air, uh, they should be regular in particle size, but as said before, some earth pigments uh, may have an, are bigger than other ones. They should be free of impurities, but again, like earth pigments, they can have inclusions of foreign matter. And the last one is they should be free of additives, but lots of pigments are topped up with film material like chalk because uh, to make up for poor tinting strength or things like that. And I always say sh should be because these are all the qualities we would like to have in our pigments and paints and pastels, but we don't always get what we want. Uh, there are four different, there are four factors that affect the quality of artist materials. Uh, one of them is the qu that quality of the material. So high quality pigments aren't going to be fugitive or reactive. Uh, and wherever possible, only highest quality pigments are used. There are good and bad qualities though. Um, and some expensive pigments like cobalts and cadmiums are hard to maintain supply. That's why they're really expensive. So there's more modern and expensive pigments like phthalo blue or green that are used to mimic those colors. Those are still like expensive, but not as expensive. Uh, the second quality is the length of time processy supposed to be processing. <laughs> um, but length of time will make a difference. More additives are used in cheaper colors because they're forcing the pigments and the binders to act in a way they want. So the consistency, the tinting strength, and the permanence is controlled, but it's also compromised. But it saves time in processing, whereas in expensive colors, each pigment is worked with uh, to give it the best possible realization of that pigment, but it does take longer to do that, uh, resulting in a more expensive pigment or material. Uh, the third one is the balance of the materials used. So the ratio of the pigment and the biter and the additive, all the components that make your material, are indicative of the quality of that material. Uh, in that sense, like the difference between artist quality and student quality, which I think is insulting. Stu students work hard. We also deserve good pigments. But regardless, so in artist quality, uh, it is created and more designed to resist chemical reactions from exposure to water, UV light, and oxygen. Uh, and they have the most pigment, which allows for more uh, medium manipulation, and it limits the color shift. Whereas in, say, student quality, it doesn't have the same processes, it has a lower pigment, less expensive formulas, and fewer available colors. It usually also has more additive and fillers to it, which will affect the quality. The final one is the intention in the market. So some materials don't need absolute permanence, like gloss house paints don't need to last forever. You're going to paint over them every couple years, and Dollarama paints are there because you're not gonna paint Mona Lisa with Dollarama craft paint, you're gonna let your four-year-old cousin use them. Um, 
and maybe you don't want the absolute like historic pure color. Hues are imitations to original colors, but they use other pigments. So they're basically close enough and maybe that's what you want instead. So this is just a very brief chart from some extensive research <laughs> into different binders and fillers for a myriad of materials. I won't go over all of them because that would be crazy, but just the ones highlighted I want to point out. So the, uh, in acrylic paints, there's two different kinds of binders. Acrylic polymer, which is for higher quality paint, or vinyl and PVA for craft acrylics. So acrylic polymer is used in really nice paints because it lasts longer long term. It remains flexible, it doesn't yellow or darken over time, and it doesn't become transparent with age. Whereas with PVA or vinyl paints, they, they become brittle with age, they have less binding strength, uh, they lose flexibility, they, and they yellow with age, and they're not as strong adhered to the support. And when you're looking at materials, you'll be able to see, oh, acrylic polymer, or say in craft or student acrylics, uh, what the binder or resin is, which is something you can look at when you're buying materials. With watercolors, dextrin, as I highlighted, can be used as a binder for cheaper paints or also as a filler. And dextrin improves the smoothness of the material. So it's okay as an additive, it is really nice. But when it's used as the main binder in the uh, school paints, it does cause it to become chalky and dry. And the last one, uh, with pastels, this overuse of binders or um, of fillers, pardon me, say like with chalk, will cause the pastel stick to become brittle and snap when its uh, pressure is applied to it. And so you want to understand like the flaws and defects of your materials so that you can prepare for the future conservation and understand like the toxicity of your materials or why your materials maybe aren't working the way you thought they are either. So what should you look for when you are buying materials? Well, terms. Uh, a big one is archival, which does mean suitable quality to be used in archives, but it has no legally binding meaning. So when you're looking at materials and it just says, oh, it's archival, but it doesn't say acid-free, lignin-free, uh, pH neutral, or has good light fastness, it's basically bull crap then. They're just putting that on the label to sell you on it. So you have to be looking at your materials and going, oh, that's sketchy. <laughs> uh, terms you should be looking for are say acid-free or pH neutral. Uh, that means it's not acidic, but it may become acidic in the future though, but that's something you just more so uh, have to be aware of. Lignin-free means the natural bonding material that holds wood fibers together has been removed. And lignin is what causes like papers to become yellow over time. Like newspapers become yellow really fast because they're cheap and full of lignin. And the last one is light fastness. It describes how resistant to fading a, a material is when exposed to light. So when something is really light fast, that means it's good. It's not going to fade very quickly. When it's not very light fast, it's going to fade rather fast. Uh, and you should also learn how to understand the labeling on your materials. So I use the golden tube because I, I'm an acrylic painter. I use golden tubes all the time. But uh, this information can also relate to uh, other mediums you use, oil paints, um, and stuff like that. So first thing you have to look at is the common name, like cadmium red light. Um, the marketing names of Arvis pigments, though, they can often have little or no relationship to the pigment in it and the chemicals that it's actually made from. Like art suppliers can do whatever they want. They're trying to sell you on something. And so they can name their paints anything they choose and will often name the pigments and paints with misleading color names or names that are more descriptive of the hue of the color and not the actual pigment. As an example, like when you see the color emerald green, that, that's a common historic name for copper arsenite or rat poison. So obviously rat poison is not going to be used anymore. <laughs> and so when you see a uh, material like emerald green, it's been substituted with less toxic materials. That's a good version of materials being substituted out. Uh, the second thing is the color index name. Uh, no, I'm not even gonna try. <laughs> uh, it's composed of three parts. 
And so this is a further means of identification that you can use when maybe you don't trust the common name and you can use this information to look up more about your pigment. So it's composed of three parts. The first part is the use and what the colorant is used for. So you'll see P for pigment. You may also see N for natural. Uh, the second part is the color, uh, and that is classified into 10 groups. So pigment yellow, pigment green, pigment orange, pigment brown. So we see ours as pigment red. And the third part is a number. It's added sequentially as the substance is added to the index. And so this specific pigment is PR108. So we can take that information and uh, find out more about our color. And I was able to, I have a book, I'll show it later. You can also find this information online, but I found other common historic names for this pigment, uh, possible toxicity, because it is full of cadmium, the chemical components, the opacity, a whole bunch of info that I was able to find just off that quick three letter name. The next thing you wanna look at is the light fastness. Um, it goes from one to three, at least for AASTM rating. One is good. Two is still pretty good, but three is not satisfactory. And you may see different kinds of light fastness ratings. You might see them just displayed as a little star, like one star for light fastness one, or um, you might see a BWS, which, which stands for blue wool scale, which is a rating for light fastness as well. And the last thing you will look at is the ASTM rating. It's just a set of standards um, for the performance of art materials, including colors, light, fastness. So if you don't see that rating on your materials, it's not adhering to a set of standards that other materials are holding up to. And so being able to find the information from reading the label will help you decide whether you want to purchase this material or not. And it will help you find more information on that material if you desire it as well. Um, it helps when you don't want to buy like 20 different types of colors and have to test out every single one to see what you're looking for. And some pigments don't work with all mediums, binders, and these all play in the labeling as well. You also want to be aware of your supports. The, it's not just the materials you're using that matters, but what you're putting that material on because your, your support can also degrade over time as well. So cotton duck is the most commonly used. It's a good cheaper option than say linen. It does vary in quality. So loose lightweight weave at nine to 10 ounces. It will shrink when stretched in size, but a tight and heavyweight canvas at 12 ounces is more stable. And linen is superior to cotton duck. It's got longer fibers in it and it is generally smoother. So the image is on the left, the cotton duck is to the left. And it's a little rougher, but it's not bad by any means, but the linen does provide a smoother surface if that's what you're looking for as well. Uh, and linen does offer better strength and durability and mold and mildew resistance, which is pretty cool. You can also buy pre-primed and stretched canvas. That's also totally fine. They come in a variety of sizes and thickness and textures, but that also means it ranges in quality. So if you're looking for a really nice pre-stretched one at an affordable price, look for seven ounce cotton primed with acid-free gesso and back stapled on solid wood stretcher bars. Very specific, but maybe it'll help you out. And you can also use canvas panels equally fine as well. It's just a different kind of canvas support. Um, you just want to make sure that it is wrapped around an acid-free board and stuck with archival glues. Other things you may want to look out for is to check to see that the canvas has been applied straight. It, as it's been stretched, the threads run parallel and aren't skewed. And you want to make sure the canvas on the back is folded nicely. You also want to make sure the primer is applied evenly. Uh, with Paper, um, like all paper is made out of plant fibers, most commonly cotton or wool or, or wood. Uh, when looking for paper that will stand the test of time, check for words like cotton rag, alpha cellulose, or lignin free. Those are your buzz, buzzwords for getting materials that will last. Because wood based is cheaper, it's made from wood pulp, and it's good, good for disposal work such as newsprint. Um, and it will start to yellow pretty quickly, but alpha cellulose is especially treated wood fiber paper, and it will last longer, and it has been compared to 
high quality cotton rag paper as well. Cotton rag is super good. It's high quality paper. Uh, the cotton has long cells, which are more stable over time. And you can get those like Arches, Fabriano, uh, places like that. I could do a full hour long lecture on Japanese paper because it's amazing and it's beautiful, but I won't, but it's made from the basso plants such as the Kozo, which has less lignin or less or not at all. The fibers are long and it's manufactured with few, if not no additives. And we use Japanese paper in conservation for repairs because it has great strength, versatility, and it doesn't react. So it's amazing but it's also really expensive because of that. Uh, and lastly, for the supports in wood, uh, all wood is permeable to moisture, which can lead to cracking and warping. Untreated wood is especially prone to wood boring insects, but as so long as you um, treat your wood properly and prime and ground it properly, that will help. But different materials like masonite, it does come in two different forms. Tempered has paraffin oil in it, which can leave a residue but you can seal it with a primer. Untampered is best, but it is rather heavy, so for large paintings, it's not the best because it can warp unless you put proper bracers on it. Uh, MDRF board is really good as well for painting. It's um, warp resistant at 12 millimeters, moisture resistant, although it may have urea formaldehyde resins. You can get it without it though. Uh, same with plywood, it has different degrees of shrinking and swelling, may contain formaldehyde, which does prevent pests, but also off gases. And with all these woods, even though they've been treated, that means whatever is, has been put into the wood may eventually start coming out as well, which will affect your material. So that's why it's important that you separate your materials from your support. And by that, I mean like putting on proper sizing and primer. So sizing prevents like ground layers of your material, such as paint from seeping through the back of the canvas or your support. Um, and especially in oil paints, you need sizing on your material. Otherwise the oil paint is just going to eat the canvas. <laughs> so you want to protect your material from the support, but you also want to protect the support from your material. And Primer is also great because it adds another layer of protection and it gives you proper adhesion between the paint layers and uh, gives you smooth surface. Uh, so what if you don't work in traditional mediums with your new fancy contemporary new age artists and you don't use uh, new materials? Well, you can, digital art preservation is equally as important um, in digital art encompasses a lot. It can be virtual reality, computer art, CGI, video installations, live capture video. And you, just because it's on a computer though, doesn't mean it's not going to, de to degrade over time. You may not have paper that can be eaten by bugs or like materials that can degrade from light, but there's still a lot of problems with conserving digital art though. Uh, one of the problems is compression. So. Uh, in order to keep file sizes small, many images are compressed. And it means little details are left out, which to the human eye is not a problem. But especially with JPEGs, uh, they use this sort of compression. And when you alter the image over and over and over, such as cropping and uploading and downloading and cropping again, those tiny details begin to show major loss. And technology obsolescence is a huge one. Like the technology is evolving so fast, it renders old storage formats obsolete, devices meaningless. Like even through my own life, it's like I've lived through um, VHS, CDs, DVDs, different types of phones, it's crazy. And then the file size is also important. It's trying to keep all this information, the money and resources are insane to try and take care of, especially when this technology changes constantly like stuff you can do is to document it so describe your work in a way that's independent of your computer or medium so it can be resurrected again uh, migrate your work like change the data over between storage types and file formats you can look at emulation which is really popular for vi old video games and that's the reproduction or the function uh, on a different type of system or you may want to go into full-on recreation. 
like as an artist, you have to start deciding like, how do you want your work to be displayed in 20 years when that uh, software and hardware doesn't exist anymore? Uh, other things you can try and do is save photographs in RAW instead of JPEG. The file is larger, but the quality is a lot better. Uh, keep a master file on your hard drive that you can always come back to. Regularly back up your data. I should have bolded and underlined that button this day and age. And also have multiple copies of your data. Physical, hard drives, cloud storage, store a copy of your data off-site. I usually go by the rule of three. So I have my master copy, I have a copy of that copy, and a copy of that copy to give to a friend in case my house burns down. Because that's another problem. <laughs> what if your uh, information is physically damaged and you can't get to it? And so with all these different types of formats and materials, especially in contemporary art, like it's existed only within the half century, but so many materials have had to have conservation work already. Because, and the way artists work now with materials is completely different to any other period in history. And there, there does need to be more research into it. And because contemporary art is so theoretical and full of composite materials, what the artist wants can often go against what the conservator wants as well. So this is uh, Joseph Bue's Capri battery. It's a light bulb plugged into a lemon. <laughs> and the energy from the lemon uh, lights up the light bulb. But the problem with that is that the lemon acid is starting to deteriorate the sculpture. Um, so the lemon is replaced every 1,000 hours, but the damage the lemon is causing, uh, unless the piece is completely repaired, the artist doesn't want though. So the piece is slowly and slowly and slowly degrading because of the lemon. And say, this piece I had on the poster, but it's Simon Starling's infestation piece, Muscle More. And I want to talk about, because one of my classmates is actually working on this piece as well. So it was a steel sculpture put into Lake Ontario, left there for two years, and zebra mussels were allowed to attach to it. It was brought back out of the water, immediately started rusting, mussels started falling off, it started stinking, and the piece needs constant conservation treatment because of all these problems. So the corrosion is actively falling off, the mussels on the corrosion are falling off, so, and they have a pile of mussels they keep on hand so they can keep gluing pieces back onto it. And so it's been constant consolidation work and it's something the AGO has agreed to take on, but not all museums and galleries want to put in this much work and money and time into the contemporary art. Uh, this is Mark Quinn's self. It's a self-portrait cast in eight, eight pints of blood, his own blood, <laughs> and this piece, needs constant, constant refrigeration. It can't not be refrigerated. Otherwise, it'll just uh, melt like the Nazis' faces in Raiders of the Lost Ark. And so with that, at some point, something is going to happen. Something's going to trip. The refrigeration is going to break. And all those faces are going to melt. Current, I'm sure there's backup plans for it. But once it starts melting, it's I don't even know what they're going to do about it because <laughs> I'm more in the mindset of it's going to melt at some point. So I'm intrigued to see what's going to happen with that. And because it's blood, it's animal body part. Pests are also <laughs> attracted to it. Uh, this one's fun. So this is Casey Jenkins' uh, performance art piece, Casting Off My Womb, where she inserted a ball of wool into her vagina and uh, knitted it. And so I didn't find any information if they kept the, the wool from it, but I'm curious about how long, if they did keep it, it's going to last. Because our bodies are acidic. That's why, as conservators, we wear gloves, because our bodies are naturally acidic. We can get fingerprints on everything, let alone what's in your hoo-ha. <laughs> Let's be honest. And so, and the material may not be able to get washed. What's on the wool is relevant to the, to the piece. That's part of the performance art. So it may never get washed, which means all that stuff is just going to keep deteriorating and eating away at the wool. So it may just be a crumble bit in a couple of years. Um, this is Piero Manzoni's Artist Shit. 
And so it's a tin can filled with the artist's feces. Though they're not sure about that because you can't x-ray it <laughs> to see what's inside. And once you open it, that completely devalues it. So they're not actually quite sure. <laughs> Um, but the problem with sealed items like this is that eventually they're going to unseal and then that's going to be a problem. The, and because it's made of tin, which is metal, that may start rusting. And let's be honest, what's inside the, t the tin can isn't going to be reacting very well <laughs> to, to being sealed. So it's stewing in its own juices. So I'm also intrigued what's going to happen when one of these explodes. It may literally be a shit show. Who knows? <laughs> uh, this is Chez Faire by Mario Mertz. So it's a, this is very composite. So it's a cooking pot filled with wax as neon writing and uh, electrical components. So this is a fire hazard, a pest hazard because of the wax. And because of the neon lighting and it's heating, it's making it extra hot. It's accelerating deterioration. And the wax attracts, attracts dust as well. From what I read, it's got like a hardened layer of dust that can't be removed. Um, although they have to change the electrical depending on exhibits because some places have different safety requirements. And the neon has to be replaced periodically. But when it's in wax, like, just, what? <laughs> Come on, help us out, artists. Uh, and then this is Robert Rauschenberg's piece, Monogram. It's oil, paper, fabric, printed paper, metal, wood, rubber shoe heel, and a tennis ball on canvas. So it's a myriad of things. But what I actually found interesting was it's had a lot of physical force uh, done to it. So lots of people have sat on the goat <laughs> and damaged it. And lots of people have written all over it. Um, and this one, this piece was actually going to be donated to the MoMA, but the director there declined to accept it because they knew the piece was degrading and they were worried about the Angora goat bringing in pests into the museum as well. Uh, one of the last ones, this is a 3D printed head and 3D printing is a huge thing right now, which is great, you can make a myriad of things, but the research into the materials used in 3D printing haven't been done as much and especially plastics, like plastics lose strength, they, be, they become brittle, crack and shrink with age as well. And unless you're choosing a very specific type of plastic that you know is archival and has been researched, this isn't more of if this happens, this is more of when this happens. So this will deteriorate, this will fall apart. It's just more of how long do we have until that happens? And there hasn't been enough research to prevent it. It's more about keeping in proper conditions and temperature, but there's not much you can do in that regard. So to wrap up, like what, there's so much with artist materials and what to buy and what to look for, but things you can do to help your work is to document it, like document everything you use, uh, materials you use, so that when you're a rich and famous artist and you pass away and your work is millions of dollars, conservators know exactly what you used and how to treat it. And the, even the most minute of detail is helpful. Uh, the second one is to understand your work. Be aware of its compatible pieces and uh, how things react with each other, adhesives you use, especially in transportation when you know maybe some materials in transportation aren't going to work very well with your piece. Another one is to be aware that your piece will deteriorate. And also, just because it is in a gallery or a museum doesn't mean it's impervious to time as well. And the last thing is to make a maintenance plan for it as well, so that when it is in a museum and gallery, uh, they have a set of standards and rules that are within reason that uh, you can work with together to achieve your artwork staying around forever. But other than that, I Rain, you're welcome to contact me if you have questions. You're welcome to contact the Western Development Museum for questions. I presume, yes? Okay, cool. <laughs> and some books I used, which I should have put in, but uh, the Artist Handbook, which is obviously a very great resource for me. Uh, you, you can't get this exact copy at the library, but there are older versions of this, which are equally fine. You can find all of the pigment information, like from the color index. You can find binder information, stuff like that. It's great. I would re 
I would really, really, really recommend it, also just for curiosity's sake, because I found out a lot about my own materials. Like, this is off tangent, but I really like using interference paint colors, and they're surprisingly archival. I'm very surprised. I thought they'd be crap, they're, but they're amazing, because I found the information in here. Or that glow-in-the-dark paints are garbage. Don't ever use them. Found that out in this book. <laughs> but uh, does anyone have any questions I can try and answer? Yeah. Well, it's perfect. Hmm? It's perfect. Uh, I would read the label, but I wouldn't trust it. It would really depend on what the spray paint is being used for. Because some of them are more so built to last, depending on the substrate they're on as well, too. Yeah, I don't know offhand, but I would read the label and start checking things out. Yeah, find this book, look at the pigments, and see if they're reactive or not. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, Two questions. Yes. So digital printmaking, um, using like, you know, like have some printers on papers, you didn't really talk too much about that. Yeah, that's also a thing that needs more research on, but uh, those may not last as long as you expect, depending on the type of printing because they are made differently and some of them aren't made to be archival. Yeah, they claim, like a lot of them claim to be archival and they claim to be, you know, like, if you read about the Epson inks, they talk about like 100 plus years, which I guess is fair. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, you realize that your art isn't, that's why. One thing you can do to test, and you can use this with all sort of materials and photographs and stuff, put it in your window for six months mm -hmm. because that's a natural way to degrade your pieces. Um, Keep one copy in a dark folder somewhere and keep the other one in the window um, and after six months, take it off and compare them and actually see how they're working. That's what I'm currently doing with my own stuff. It's super scientific and easy. And you can, lots of people have done that online too. So if you're curious about your materials, Google it, see if other people have done it first too. Yeah. So there's a product on the market called, like they have various names, but it's like hair skin or stone skin or something like that. And it's a, uh, it's a, it's a, I don't know, it's, you call it a paper, but it's made mostly out of calcium carbonate and binders. Mm. And, and uh, <laughs> it, it, it's, it, lots of artists in town are using it. Mm. And I'm just curious, is that, do, it's really hard to find information on it. You talk to the manufacturer and they say they haven't got it certified yet, but they claim it is. Uh, um, I would be scared skeptical of it, especially since if it hasn't been on the market for long. Most research is done when things start to deteriorate, essentially. So it's hard to say. Um, I would look it up in the book. <laughs> it probably isn't, but, um, and you even contacted the, uh, that's usually a good go-to. Yeah, well, you know, they said it's a long process to get certified. Yeah, and they're also wanting to sell you on stuff too, so yes. I would half only trust them yeah. as well. Um, it's an interesting would, thing. Yeah. It's, like, it's almost like a sheet of, of flexible paper plastic. It's, it's really ah. a weird substance. And I would find anything with a lot of additives is bad. It's yeah. not going to last as long. Like the Japanese paper is so great because it has little to no additives and the fibers are naturally long in it. And it's, it doesn't have super special additives or anything in there either. So I'm more inclined to not trust things with a lot of additives because all that stuff is, is eventually going to leak out. That's why plastics aren't as archival as people think. Like they look super strong and great, but plasticizers and stuff in the plastic just start to leach out. Yeah. And it's, again, not if, but when. And then they just go through that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I hope that semi answered your question. No, that's okay. I, I didn't expect that. <laughs> But now it's something I'll look into as well, though. Terra skin. Okay. Okay. Because maybe I'll buy a piece and just put it in my window and see. Oh. Okay. I think probably our placement does well, but I'm not sure. Awesome. Yeah, I'll check it out. Thank you. Well, it's nice to know what new materials to look at, too, though. I even have a stack of chunks. Or stick it in your window <laughs> and let us know. Okay, I'll print something on it and I'll stick it Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, anybody else? Yes. Yeah, I've been doing a lot of textile uh, work since I've been up, upcycling, you know, and um, I've bought some very inexpensive, beautiful uh, needlework that people have made in, you know, down the village. Mm -hmm. 
You could. I wouldn't use any detergents or anything, though. I would just use plain water to rinse it and hand wash it. Have it in a little tub and just rinse it gently. Mm -hmm. And don't like crumble and fold it over. Just very gently and air dry it as well. So lay it out to dry and watch it. Right? Yeah? OK, sweet. <laughs> anything else? What if you could say huh? anything, Ray, about the, uh, or if you know mm -hmm. about the restoration that seems to have been it's supplanted by uh, conservation mm. and it sort of points to a kind of a, a historical mm. shift in the way we think about hanging on to our objects now. Yeah, whereas more with conservators we're trying to keep the piece as it is in its current state with minimal intervention because the way that piece is is relevant to its history and how it got to that point whereas full on restoration it's it's the same piece in a sense, but it's brought up to standard it was never meant to be at, potentially. And that always has the way of going too far. Like I always think of car restorers, they're bringing in pieces from other cars to restore the car. Whereas when we conserve a car, we're trying to keep it as minim minimally altered as possible and trying to keep the original paint how it is, stuff like that. Does that sort of answer your question? Fish? Yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? When you're working with ferrous metals, can I layer the rust off sheet and not to the middle of your meat? Yes, I can. Um, and usually when we're conserving, we want to keep that protective layer as well. So we're not bringing a piece right back to its shiny metal because that's exactly it. It's protecting it as well, so long as it's not actively corroding because of it. Uh, if it's actively corroding, it'll be like orange splotches and gross like that, right? Is that a thing? Encrustations? Or like, like. Some guys have a wet look, or it'll be brighter colors, but if it's not actively dull colored. But if it's actively super bright, orange is a red so it shows that there's active rust going on. So, as long as it's dull, then nothing's actually. Anything else? Awesome. Well, thank you all for coming. <laughs> yeah, and if you have any questions, like feel free to contact me as well or Mark. <laughs> Putting you on the spot, but thank you very much. Mm -hmm.